In single variable calculus, a derivative has two main concepts attached to it. It was the rate of change and it was the slope of the tangent line to the graph. The first of these is a definition in terms of functions. Functions measure something and a derivative measures how that thing is changing. The second though is geometric. If I think about a function using its graph, its picture, then the idea of a tangent line to the graph makes sense. The derivative then supplies the slope of that line using a point on the graph. Since I have a point and a slope, I can then calculate the equation of this tangent line. The new derivatives that I've defined so far, partials, gradients, directional derivatives, they all work on the first idea of the derivative as a rate of change. The partial is a rate of change in one of the variables. The gradient was the direction that gave the greatest change, and the directional derivative was a rate of change in a specific direction. But what about tangents? For parametric curves, tangents generalized very well, going from slopes to the tangent vector that indicated the instantaneous direction and speed of the curve. What is the equivalent idea for scalar fields? Well, for single variable functions, the tangent came from looking at the graph. So let me look at the graph of a scalar field. Here's a graph I used last week when I first introduced the idea of a scalar field. What is the tangent line to this graph? Well, if I choose a point on the graph and I ask for a tangent line, I run into an issue. I have too many choices. I can draw many lines through this point which are tangent to the graph, and those lines have various different slopes. So tangent lines are not the answer. But let me think about all those tangent lines. If I put them all together, I can think of a tangent plane to this point. And this now makes sense as a unique thing. Each point on this graph will have a unique tangent plane attached to that point. This is how the idea of a tangent line extends to higher dimensions. A scalar field def defined on R2 has tangent planes. And a scalar field defined in R3 has a graph which lives in R4, and it has tangent three spaces, three-dimensional flat subspaces in R4, which are tangent to its graph, and so on up into more unseeable dimensions, where each tangent plane will be a hyperplane of one dimension less than the dimension where the graph lives. So there is a tangent plane to a two-variable scalar field. How do I describe it? Well, take a point in the domain, AB, so that the point AB, F of AB, is a point on the graph. I can describe a plane if I know a point and two local directions. If, from that point, I look in the direction 1, 0 in the domain, the rate of change of the function, how much it increases, is the partial in x, f sub x of AB, using the subscript notation for partials in this video. Therefore, the vector 1, 0, partial in x evaluated at AB, is a local direction vector on the tangent plane. In that direction, it has the right rate of increase. In the same way, for the y-axis direction, 0, 1, and then the partial in y evaluated at AB is also a local direction vector for the plane. Then, following the algorithm for equations of planes, the cross product of the local directions produces the normal. Here is that cross product. This vector made of the two partial derivatives is the normal to the tangent plane. Now I have a point in a normal, so I can write the equation of the tangent plane. The normal gives the coefficients of the equation of the tangent plane, except for the constant on the other side. To calculate this constant, I put the point back into the plane. Recall that the point is AB, F of AB, since this is on the graph. It includes the input AB and the output F of AB. Putting in that point gives a value for C. This is a complicated expression, but there are no variables X or Y left in it, so this expression is a constant and can be used for C. I put it into the C's place to give this expression for the equation of the plane. And there are a number of ways to write this. For future needs, it will be convenient to write it in this particular form, where I factor the partials out of the two terms where each of them shows up. 
This is pretty tricky without actual numbers, so let me calculate a tangent plane. I'll use a ver function very similar to the graph I showed earlier. So here's a function and its partials. I want to calculate the tangent plane at the point 1, 1, 1 third, which is a point on the graph of the function because f of 1, 1 is equal to 1 third. I evaluate the partials at this point. Then I have the equation of the tangent plane from the previous slide at the top of this slide. I'll just insert the pieces to get this equation. And I can rearrange this if I wish to put it in a more familiar form for the equation of a plane. And that's it. This is the tangent object for this function described by an equation. It is calculated by the partials and captures the behavior of the function at that point. Here's the same function, but at the point 0, 0, 1. I have the same steps, the partials, evaluate the partials at the point, put into the form of the equation of the tangent plane, and then simplify if I wish. The result here is that the tangent plane is the horizontal plane z equals 1. That makes sense. In the graph, the point 0, 0, 1 was at the top of a hill, and the tangent plane at the very top should be a horizontal plane. So what exactly does a tangent plane tell me about the scalar field? A tangent line in single variable calculus was a good local approximation, and it showed how the function was changing at a specific point by comparing it with a straight line. And the same is true here by comparing to a plane, but it's a bit trickier to intuit. Let me give you another interpretation of a tangent plane one inspired by more advanced differential geometry that makes very heavy use of tangent planes and similar constructions. Consider a parametric curve gamma in R3 and a scalar field with two inputs. The graph of the scalar field is a surface in R3 as well. I'm going to assume that the curve, ha curve happens to lie exactly on the graph. All points of the curve are part of the graph of the function. The curve moves along the graph of the scalar field. And there are many such curves. So let me consider their tangents. These tangents give local directions to points on the graph. One interpretation of the tangent plane is that it is the home for these curve tangents. Any tangent to a curve that moves entirely along the graph of a function will be a tangent in the tangent plane as a local direction vector. So the tangent plane is the set of the tangents for curves which align with the graph of the function. I can demonstrate this. Here is the same function I used earlier in the examples, and here is its tangent plane at the point 1, 1, 1 third. I've given two curves here, gamma 1 and gamma 2. Both are curves on the graph. You can check that if I take the x and y coordinates of the curve and put them into the function, I do get 1 over 1 plus the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared for the third component. The curve satisfies the relationship that the z coordinate is 1 over 1 plus the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared. That's the graph, so the curve is on the graph. I can calculate their tangents and then evaluate at t equals 1, which for both curves gives the point 1, 1, 1 third, which you can check the arithmetic if you want. Then I have two local directions. Two local directions on a plane define a normal by their cross product. So I take that cross product and I recover exactly the normal to the plane that I calculated earlier, the normal whose coefficients you can see in the equation at the top of the page. And this shows that the tangents to the two curves at 1, 1, 3 are local direction vectors that live in the tangent plane to the scalar 